Um, I don't know if you all read this article about a year ago in the New York Times, but uh, we're kind of in a crisis, uh, the architectural discipline is. Uh, this was written not only about uh, architecture, but about kind of the, the problem uh, we're seeing in graduate education, the cost. Um, and uh, the quote, want a job, go to college, and don't major in architecture was the primary recommendation of uh, Ms. Ramble in this article. What later was in the uh, art article was that architecture has now replaced English literature as the uh, discipline least likely to give you a job. Uh, and uh, Adam did mention that my uh, undergraduate degree is in English literature <laughs> and my uh, graduate degree in architecture. <laughs> so I'm probably the least employable person in this room. <laughs> But um, needless to say, that's probably why we're doing what we're doing. Um, this, I think this problem was sort of foreseen before, though. This is uh, one of our heroes, the architect Giancarlo De Carlo. And he kind of wrote about the, cr the potential crisis of architecture um, if we kind of left it to what was going on even in the 70s. He wrote this in 1978 um, in, his, in the first issue of his publication, Space and Society, which... I uncovered during our work kind of researching some of this uh, history of the social impact of architecture. Um, just to read it, contemporary architecture tends to produce objects while its real role should be that of generating processes. We'll probably return to that in a little bit. Um, but this distortion, he calls it, confines architecture to a very narrow strip of a larger spectrum. And I think that's a really important idea. Uh, and then, of course, leaving it open to the risks of dependency and megalomania. Uh, something that might lead to social and political indifference. Something that might lead, in essence, to where we're seeing architecture now as devalued and hard to actually employ architects in the current situation we're in. Um, he also called this a sort of false dichotomy. If we focused on architecture as something that was objects and not processes, uh, we could divide architecture between what we've called capital A architecture uh, and just sort of regular building. Um, or other dichotomies have emerged, humanitarian architecture, social architecture, and capital A architecture. This kind of bifurcation of the discipline actually has a great potential problem uh, to sort of lead in directions and kind of narrowly define architecture among objects instead of the sort of generative processes, he calls them, which actually produces our built environment. This bifurcation actually uh, appeared to us uh, in another way in the, in the world of public health. Um, this is Dr. Paul Farmer, who's a visionary leader of an organization called Partners in Health, which we ended up working with. And he talked about this bifurcation as well in medicine, similar problems he saw in global health, where he said, um, why should we be choosing between uh, the addressing what he called the distal or the proximal implications of health? So uh, why should we only put in funding to stop the bleeding, for example, when we clearly need to be investing in uh, the systems of health to stop the potential of uh, kind of, let's say, gunshot wounds or something like that in the, in the future. The social and economic indicators of health, you would call them, are as important to invest in as uh, the medical care that's needed to stop the bleeding. And the two at once uh, are as important to fund uh, or important to pay attention to uh, as just one or the other. And, and so this, I think, relates in many ways to architecture and uh, I think will drive kind of this, this talk and I hope a kind of conversation afterwards. Um, we started this organization in many ways because we met Paul. We met Paul in 2006, um, and he was giving a lecture at Harvard when we were students. Uh, he was talking about uh, the work that his organization was doing globally in about 13 countries. Um, and they're working in some of the most marginalized communities in some of the more rural regions of the world. Uh, they started in Haiti and have moved on to Malawi uh, and in Rwanda, Lesotho, and other places. Um, but Paul wasn't talking about the healthcare. He was talking about the buildings that they were building, clinics, schools even, uh, and homes. And this was really interesting as a young architecture student to hear Paul talk about uh, building of houses when, and calling that the improvement of healthcare. So he was calling houses healthcare. And this sort of unique framing I hadn't really heard before. Uh, and so of course I went up to him afterwards to ask, this is amazing, who are the architects that are working with you and how could we potentially connect? Of course, he said, architects, why would I ever use an architect? I just draw this stuff on napkins, is what he said. Which I think goes back to this problem of the job issue that we talked about. Um, there's too many napkins, too little jobs. Um, but this is a sort of bigger disconnect, I think, where the, the, 
this sort of dialogue between, let's say, an organization that's out there building a huge amount of infrastructure, like Partners in Health, uh, and then an architectural discipline, which is largely out of work, underfunded, um, and not connecting to what is ultimately a marketplace that's needed to be filled. He talked about uh, healthcare, uh, and he talked about it not simply as the place where, he talked about hospitals as uh, sort of problematic places as well. He talked about them not as what we might imagine a place you go to heal. Uh, you think about this emergency room, you go to a hospital and get better. He talked about it as places often that you go and get much sicker. Uh, in the US alone, in fact, um, medical errors and what's called hospital acquired infections are among some of the leading causes of death in the US, killing more Americans than AIDS, breast cancer, and even automobile accidents. Um, but in resource poor settings, or in the sort of global south, this is actually quite a bigger problem. This is the hospital in Tugela Ferry, South Africa, where in 2006, an outbreak of what's called extremely drug resistant tuberculosis emerged. And of that outbreak, and many of, it, many of the reasons for it was patients were waiting in hallways like this, hallways not designed specifically for uh, hospital-borne infections or airborne infection control, as it's called. Of the patients that received or sort of contracted this disease, all of them died in less than three months. Um, and this new strand of tuberculosis is a potential epidemic strand, one that's very hard to treat, is resistant to m most of the mainline drugs. And the reason it occurred or was incubated or cultivated because of a failure of sort of lack of design. As the director said, the hospital wasn't designed for airborne infection control. This sort of lack of design helps you incubate, cultivate, and ultimately kill these patients. And so this poor design that actually is having a direct health outcome, a direct outcome on our lives, is something I think we really need to resonate on, think about deeply. Um, because it's this notion that Paul talks about, about the bare minimum. He asks in healthcare, why do the poor deserve the basic the bare minimum healthcare, why, can't they, why don't they get the best that medicine has to offer? I think for us to start to rethink architecture, we have to ask that same question. Why is it that marginalized communities are getting the, the worst infrastructure, the worst architecture, and not necessarily the best? Why aren't we able to apply the best in design to the most marginalized communities? So these solutions aren't being designed, and there's a number of reasons for them. It's not simply we don't care. This is simply an ethical problem. This is a sort of larger systemic problem. One of those is that there's a lack of capacity, a kind of disconnect of capacity, where the majority of projects, uh, the majority of uh, planners and architects are actually what might be called the global north or the quote unquote developed world. Um, but of course, the vast majority of projects are happening in the global south. If you look at um, Africa alone, there's about 35,000 licensed architects in the entire continent. Um, which, this is a scalar figure of Italy, I don't know if you've uh, <laughs> Just saying that, really, really popular architecture discipline in Italy. Um, <laughs> I'll probably a lot less to do during the current economic crisis. Um, this obviously is a huge problem. This disconnect is, is also a big piece of that problem. So addressing the issue of building a new kind of infrastructure is not simply going to be about saying we want to. It's also about investing in this deeper socioeconomic reality that keeps that infrastructure from emerging. I think the second big issue is that there are very few incentives to work in these contexts. Construction costs are very low, um, and it's actually really difficult to afford architecture and design. The kind of design that, uh, design research that's so imperative that um, DLAN Studio is doing, I think showing amazing examples of, that's the kind of research that's needed um, in the most marginalized communities, and that has to be afforded. Um, and this economic reality is, I think, also a big piece of the problem that we have to start addressing through a different type of architectural practice model. Correlations between these construction costs, I think, helps us think about this other issue. It's not simply about money. It's not simply about how, what's the cheapest and most efficient form of design or infrastructure. It's actually about rethinking value. How do we revalue architecture to, have, to add value to places, and then from that, create a new marketplace? So we lean on, again, health, and in this case, uh, Michael Porter from the business school writing about our current state of healthcare. And he says the same thing about healthcare, that the healthcare market um, in the US has, has misaligned its values. Um, that if we revalue health to be focused on uh, results, to be focused on impact, that we can actually start to afford healthcare itself. Since value depends on results, he says, not inputs, value in healthcare is measured by the outcomes achieved. So if we shift focus from, vol from volume, how cheap, how efficient, 
is the commodity of architecture, or as John Carlin might say, the object of architecture, and instead focus on the process of building, this might shift the value itself. So six years ago, we were invited to Rwanda to test out some of these ideas of value creation and the idea that possibly the better design, the better built hospital could produce better health outcomes. Rwanda's, uh, this region of Rwanda is on the northern border of the country with Uganda at the southern edge of this chain of volcanoes, this incredibly stunning landscape. It's also the densest country in Africa with 10 million people in a country the size of Maryland. But in this particular district where Partners in Health had been asked to expand their services, there were 400,000 people with not even a single doctor. And this was the beginning of a process, and this is the, one of the most important things we learned, that to understand the challenges and to understand the opportunities was to be there on the ground, learning from the communities that knew it best and the stakeholders. And so that meant Michael moving to Rwanda for a year, working closely not only with the team from Partners in Health, but local leaders like then Mayor Aime Boseni Bamwe, who's now the governor of this entire region, and thought leaders like the Minister of Health there, Dr. Agnes Benigawahu. And it's through those relationships that the questions that we wouldn't have even known to ask are uncovered. So, if we've learned that buildings can kill, as we saw in Tugela Ferry, or as we see even in hospitals in the United States, the first lesson we had to try and prove was, can a building heal? And so we drew some very simple conclusions. If people are getting sick in hallways, unventilated, crowded spaces, would it be possible to have a hospital without any? And in an idyllic climate like Rwanda, that's more than possible. And so the hospital is designed as a campus. With, with open air, covered verandas for circulation, completely eliminating that possible danger zone. People wait in these open, covered spaces where it's pleasant year round and avoid the possibility of airborne infection. Further, it's located on the top of this hilltop where it has access to the prevailing breezes that will maintain that uh, infection control within the ward itself. But building a hospital for, for this community, one that only six years ago had not even a doctor, is about more than infection control and improving ventilation. It's about constructing dignity, as we were taught by Partners in Health. And that means design from the patient perspective. And so one of the next things we learned was that in that you have to have a common ward in this setting because there isn't the human resources to support individual patient rooms like you have here. So while we were there trying to combat airborne infection, what we discovered is that that was secondary to making sure there was ample oversight. So in the open ward, what we found is that the typical scenario was that the beds are aligned against the, the walls, looking in. And we thought, well, Personally, if I was stuck in the hospital with 20 other sick people, the last thing I would want to be doing is looking across at another sick person. And so instead, that situation is inverted, trying to create a sense of privacy where patients look outside into either that stunning mountain landscape or this beautiful courtyard. That's, that is, the, the building is built around this umavuma tree, which has historical significance. It's a, a ficus but is, is uh, known as where the, the king has come through this particular area and camped. So you have the king's tree and then those smaller trees that you can see in the background are the soldiers protecting it. If the uh, first lesson is can buildings themselves function in such a way to heal, um, I think tying back to some of the things that were brought up before in the kind of fail-safe or resilient way? Can buildings perform in such a way? The second thing we learned is uh, how can the building process heal? Going back to De Carlo's statement, if the process is really important, that too um, can pull together resources and socioeconomic indicators which can help heal uh, communities. And um, this, began, uh, this began with this project um, when we, we realized we were overwhelmed with trying to build a hospital while still being students and living there. So the first thing we had to do with uh, actually 
don't tell anyone. Well, now I'm telling all of you. Grant money from, uh, like traveling grant money we got from Harvard. is <laughs> actually fund the salary of our first employee, Sierra Bainbridge. <laughs> and uh, Sierra Bainbridge uh, came over uh, to Rwanda to run this project, but before that she was the project manager of the High Line here in New York. Um, and this again is in 2008, during the sort of bottom of the financial crisis when every one of the architects that are leaving school, we know our friends are not getting work. And she had one of the one secure jobs here in New York, opening the first, uh, the first uh, sort of part of the High Line and moving on to the second. I uh, decided to leave that and, and move to Rwanda to run this construction process. And she was very involved in, in not only the sort of development of the building, but also the de uh, development of the building process. Um, and some of those issues were how not only do we uh, sort of use this process of building as a kind of economic engine in this community itself. How do we, i.e., hire as much local labor as possible? How do we use as much local material as possible to sort of generate an economy of that space? Um, and this was sort of driven very much by our partner on the ground, whose uh, name is Bruce Nizé, uh, with kind of an unlinked photo. You can really see him clearly in this one. Um, but Bruce Nizé uh, is a kind of genius uh, engineer here in Rwanda. And the questions that he, he was asking from the beginning was, um, maximizing local labor is the opportunity, right? Labor is really inexpensive, material is very expensive. It's a sort of inverse of what we might see in the US. And so if that's the scenario, can we um, actually use the construction process itself to kind of maximize impact? So in the condition of, let's say, uh, excavating this entire hill, um, he asked, well, instead of bringing a backhoe from the capital, which costs $10,000 a week and we have to hire um, a technician to drive it and house and, and feed him, uh, could we just use local labor? And instead hire a thousand people that work on three shifts a day um, to excavate it with their own hose and shovels. This very simple idea actually allowed us to excavate the hill by hand, which seems crazy, um, in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost of that, of that bulldozer. So that kind of totally awakened us to the idea that architectural processes are about you know, labor creation, right? It's about craft development. It's about unskilled labor and also skilled labor. And so Bruce's other strategy was thinking about how do we customize through uh, skilled labor every piece of the hospital itself? Can we uh, use craftsmen and develop every piece of furniture and design it on site and build it? I mean, in this scenario, in this case, which is kind of our favorite uh, example is how do we use local masons and use a kind of volcanic rock from this very region um, and kind of fine-tune that craft to create a new image of what this hospital could be. So this is a typical Rwandan wall um, in, in this region. You see it, it's mostly about the mortar and not so much about the stone, but of course the stone is incredibly beautiful. Um, and uh, this is one of the masons that came on Hakiza, and this is in 2009, and you can see he's like cutting these stones in a really beautiful way. And, and we worked closely with Bruce and also with the Masons to develop a stone wall of no, of no, ma uh, no mortar almost, a kind of uh, mortarless wall, at least the image of that. Um, and this took some time and some back and forth and Hakiza was one of the kind of main Masons who really got it well. And um, you can see the hospital, the front of the hospital, the entire lower level is wrapped in the stone. It's a huge amount of masonry work, but of course it's a very cheap material and labor is relatively inexpensive, so this kind of customization is totally possible. Um, and the story goes, which is totally amazing, is the, the masons started on that corner, and they, by the time they wrapped around this whole building, they were so good at putting this stone together, Hakiza was like an expert, um, that they asked if they could take down the original wall and rebuild it with this new skill which is like totally amazing, you know. <laughs> I, I'm like, uh, we can't, you know, you have to keep a time on. And this is what they produced, um, which itself to us, I think, informed us about another element which I think was missing, which is, and we get, you know, there was sort of criticism, you know, you're going into Rwanda, you know, we just need one basic bare minimum hospital, we don't have time for design. Um, but this is even an aesthetic decision, this is a decision that's about the cladding not about the airflow, not about the health impacts, and even this decision, even decisions about the materials which may skin a building, if designed, if designed, uh, if the process is designed correctly um, to achieve impact, can have a massive impact on the community. And this taught us a kind of third lesson, which you know, we, we, you know, this has been called resource limited settings. It always goes from you know, third world, developing world, resource limited settings. Global South is always a sort of it'll change into something else. But I think resource limitation was what it was when we first got there in 2006. Um, but we realized this isn't really 
uh, sort of a great term for this area because it's really about resourcefulness. I mean, using the materials that we have locally and using them well is a sense of resourcefulness. And that's what's possible uh, in working in, in economies in the global south. And something that's a huge opportunity we may not have, have uh, in other economies. So I just got back from, uh, from Rwanda last week and uh, this is Hakiza. I took this picture two weeks ago. And I asked him to get in the same position as the other picture. <laughs> and I showed him, I showed him the, the, this picture that was published in a magazine. And he said, oh man, the, the seams between those rocks totally suck. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he didn't have a tool, so he kind of pretended his hand was his tool. Um, and he was he's so proud of the stonework. And this is actually, this isn't the hospital. This is so, this is so rad. This is actually a woman's house outside of the capital, three hours from the hospital itself. And she saw pictures of the stone wall and said, I, I want that in my house. And then hired the same team to come and develop that stone wall. It like blew our minds. I was like, I have to see this thing. And then Hakiz is there making this incredibly refined, even more refined masonry. Um, you know, the sort of transfer the creation of skills to the building process. We forget this when we think about how quickly do we build? How much can we prefabricate? Um, how much can the industrial process make efficient our construction process? Or we should think of the inverse, especially in a setting like Rwanda. How do we maximize impact is the question. So this continues. Uh, we realize this is a, a sort of issue of what some might call capacity building. We like to call share, capacity sharing, a kind of exchange of expertise on the ground. Um, and Sierra Bainbridge, of course, when she was, came over there, she knew this and said, uh, if we're going to construct this hospital, we're going to construct this other school project we're doing, we also have to deeply invest not only in the creation of a capacity on site of masons, for example, but invest in the kind of national, uh, national improvement of architectures. So in 2006, a background story, there was no school of architecture in Rwanda, about 10 architects in the entire country um, when we got there. And uh, the first school of architecture started in 2008, and Sierra quickly became the head of department. And so it was training the first class of architects. Um, now the first class will graduate 25 this year, um, which is a total another success story, which we're really, really proud of. Um, but what's so great about it is that they're able to use pro projects like that masonry wall, um, the school project we're working on, and other architects that are coming into the country to, to build uh, as, as case studies on a new way of practice. This is Amelie, who was an intern with us, and we'll pro we're going to sweep up again. She graduates this year. And we asked her you know, what she believes architecture could be, or what it is. She said, not only rich people have right to ideas as architects, the whole community must benefit. A totally powerful idea that um, you know, these are some of the most well-trained people in Rwanda who could quickly get jobs overseas. And the idea that they would invest in staying locally, but building practices locally, but also committing uh, their lives to a notion of the sort of marginal, the marginalized communities and bringing architecture to those communities uh, is really powerful to us. So, as Michael said, when, when we arrived in 2007, there were fewer than 10 licensed architects because of a lack of access to education. Well, a couple of those people were undeterred by that barrier. Uh, they're seen here, Commode and his friend Christian in red, Commode is the guy pointing to the drawing. So after they graduated as two of the highest scoring students from their high school, they received scholarships to move to Shanghai. In Shanghai, they learned Mandarin in one year. Then they went to architecture for five years. To then return to Rwanda, where we were lucky enough to work with them on the hospital. So Commode was part of the CA team who oversaw the construction of the hospital. And on the second phase, he became the project manager of our first design build project, housing for the staff that would live there. And as the project manager, he trained not only our Rwandan colleagues, but also the American fellows that came over there to learn about this process. So this is him overseeing a, a, what it took from, from the mass team to build these houses. But what is more remarkable is the construction team that he oversaw. Here's him leading a site meeting. Here's the 400 people that he's instructing on what to do. Over the course of this project, 1,000 people worked on these four houses. Houses that 
a donor came and said, we're absolutely necessary to, to retain the best doctors. This is an extremely rural part of Rwanda. So what was happening was the doctors were coming, working there, and then commuting back to the city on the weekends. And also, as part of a, a human resources collaboration between many US institutions and the Rwanda government, they were bringing US specialists, surgeons, to practice and train alongside their Rwandan colleagues. But how could you convince a, a specially trained surgeon to come live in this remote part of Rwanda for a year? Well, this one donor had an idea that it was about housing and providing a dignified environment for the staff of the hospital as well. And so these are, these are the houses that were built in the, the first phase of housing to be developed. The, as I said, Commode managed not only the design, but the construction process and the procurement process. So we're, we're lucky enough to just get these photos. Uh, Iwan Bon, who took many of the photos we've seen tonight, uh, we're privileged to have him uh, give these to us. So as part of this process, the, the building, we decided to test out new ideas. What other impacts could we have on the local economy in terms of changing the production of a building? And so we started from the, the brick. And in, in Rwanda, a quickly uh, or rapidly uh, deforest, a deforested country, um, we decided to look for what were more sustainable products. So we brought in a compressed stabilized earth brick press from India, which our team first trained on in Haiti, and then brought that team to train our team in Rwanda. Produced every brick on site, training the entire team how to manufacture those bricks to then be used on this project, but then in other projects around the community. So here you just see a few, a few photos to, of, of the houses and uh, of the interior. So after manufacturing all of the bricks, we converted the brick making shop that was at the bottom of the site into a furniture manufacturing shop where our team, led by one of our fellows, manufactured virtually every piece of furniture in the house from the light fixtures to the tables and chairs. The chairs were actually designed by the first intern to ever come and volunteer for, for mass, and we're still using them. Every uh, chair in our office there has this chair made by local weavers. Um, and so you see everything is able to be customized because of that inversion of the labor equation and looking to the opportunities of context for what can really be achieved. But um, just to, before we move on, we were also just there, we got to see the doctors after they moved into these houses only a couple of months ago. And a couple of interesting stories on both sides of the equation. The idea was to bring together Rwandan doctors with American doctors to build a kind of community of training. Uh, one of the American doctors that had been there for the previous year, staying in not these houses, uh, said that she had volunteered to stay on another year because the houses were available. But of, of more importance to us, the medical director, who was one of those doctors who commuted, who commuted back to the city on the weekends to be with his family, when, when they were done, he sent uh, his wife a photo of the houses and she texted him back saying, when do we move? <laughs> and so, I, I mean, for that, it was, this was the brainchild of a donor who saw this as a need in extending the quality of care in the region, and, and we really see that manifested in, in the way people have responded to it. Um, so I just got back uh, from, the, from East Africa, and this is Komodo, and we were in Tanzania for a new, a new project. Um, and this is him leading a class of students, uh, asking them how they, what they would do to redesign their school, which is totally amazing. Um, and I wanna tell the story about Commode to the development of this because it helps us also understand where in architecture we might actually position ourselves. Um, the client is the African Wildlife Foundation and they asked us to come and start working on the design of a number of schools for them in a series of heartlands that they oversee the conservation of throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And this one, the first one was in Tanzania, but the, the one they're really interested in was in this part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, in, a, in a small village called Ilima. And Alima is one of the most remote places in the world. You have to fly into Kinshasa, which is on the west coast. 
um, take a charter flight to Lubumbashi, and then take a riverboat and then a, a five to nine hour motorcycle ride in mountain passes to this small village. <laughs> so this is an incredible design problem, right? Um, it, kind of, it basically means that no building material that cannot fit on the back of a motorcycle can be used. Seriously. And you also are on the back of a motorcycle. Um, and they, uh, th this partner loved Commode and, and they wanted really Commode to lead this project and we're sort of in negotiation now and I, I'm just bringing it up, it's a brand new project but it's kind of exciting. But uh, Commode was very interested in going and he'd have to virtually move to this community and build it on site forage for materials in that region um, and basically live there until it's completed. And uh, as a Rwandese, uh, he was told uh, by the Congolese uh, director of the program that actually it might be problematic for him to come, he should check. And it turns out that actually he'd be very unsafe for a Rwandese to actually go to Congo with a Rwandan passport. That none of our Rwandan team uh, could, could go and work on this project because the Congolese uh, would not trust, they could be spies. There's a, there's a conflict, there's an actual physical conflict. You may know about this armed conflict on the border of Rwanda and, and, and Congo, and it's a kind of ongoing war. Um, but to Komodo, this was quite devastating. Komodo has family in, in the Congo, as many Rwandese do. Um, and to him, this sort of struck a chord. Um, and he said, you know, this is actually a crisis. Like, why can't I actually help with this project? I mean, it saddened him significantly uh, to not be able to work on it. Um, you may know about this conflict, but a lot of this conflict is driven, of course, by these sort of economic drivers, especially around coltan, which is in every laptop and cell phone that you use. So our sort of purchasing power in the U.S. is helping drive a kind of black market economy and real economy, global economy, that helps destabilize this region um, and helps develop this sincere distrust between these two nations. So when we asked Kamode um, what his, we had a kind of retreat when we were there, and we asked him what he thought. Um, the future of architecture could be, what, why he believes in the impact of architecture. And he reflected on this story of Alima, and he said this amazing thing. He said, you know, we can't measure friendship, but we can actually measure conflict. But I actually believe if I worked on this project, that through architecture, through the construction process, country to country, we could actually build towards peace. This idea that architecture actually could produce peace was a transformative idea something that sort of, I think almost destabilizes our notion of thinking about what it is to build and how we build. And also the idea that if we don't build correctly, the stakes are quite high. Just as if uh, buildings can make us sicker, we ask how can they make us healthier. So too we have to ask if the building process can make us, uh, can actually produce conflict. We have to always be asking as architects, how do our design decisions, how do our building construction and process decisions help reduce conflict? If that's a conflict between, let's say, animals and wild, uh, wildlife and humans, like with the African Wildlife Foundation, or if it's specifically between communities. It'd be, you know, Kamode elaborated further. He said it's not only Rwanda and Congo, it's actually Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, and the rural region, uh, where there's ethnic differences. How do we bridge those divides? And so this notion that the building process is one of healing uh, is something that I think we have to keep in mind as architects, that we affect that with every design decision we make, from the facade system to the materials we choose for furniture, uh, to the way in which it's processed and built. So I think the probably best example of this, to kind of, to kind of end our, our talk, is of course Haiti, um, where uh, th this is a picture immediately after the earthquake, but you know, t we like to remind people it's 250,000 plus people are dead, not because of an earthquake, not because of climate change, not because of uh, the sort of crisis of the environment, but actually because of failure of buildings. Right? It's buildings that fell on people that killed them after the earthquake. And in many ways, it's our responsibility to think about the, the process which constructed those buildings that then failed. Of course, immediately after the earthquake, we had another outbreak, this of cholera. And uh, this is a public health crisis, which maybe even more than tuberculosis, um, is directly related to the failure of our built environment, to the failure of the infrastructures uh, that we create or, or, or lack or don't create or fail to design. Um, settings like this is where obviously waste and, and water is, is all around the capital in Port-au-Prince. Um, and we were asked uh, uh, during the crisis by this incredibly visionary doctor, Dr. Uh, John Pop, uh, 
to help design and build a cholera treatment center uh, in the first, it would be the first permanent cholera treatment center in the city. Cholera treatment centers were looking like this, mostly out of tents, had to be replaced maybe once or twice a year. Um, it was a sort of crazy emergency. It's one of the worst crises of, of cholera to uh, happen in, in the last century. Um, and the opportunity, realizing that it would be 15 to 20 years that cholera would be in, in Haiti now, um, how do we develop something that would be resilient, something that would address and help to stem the transmission of this disease? Um, so this is where we brought in uh, some of that worked on the design of the hospital in Rwanda to move to Haiti and develop this process. This is David Saladik, also a student at uh, the Graduate School of Design with us and had helped in the early phases of the hospital and now moved to Haiti, was working on this very issue around cholera. Um, again, using the immersive research process, he went in and worked with the laborers and said, how many of you know what we're building? Um, or how many don't know what we're building? <laughs> and this many raised their hands. And he said, okay, well, we need to get through what we're actually building, what the impact of this building will be, how we address the direct health impacts of, let's say something like cholera, um, a waterborne disease, through a better building. So the design of this project, which is under construction, will be completed in, in June. Um, the design around this is really actually how do we stem cholera? So what we found was one big crisis of cholera was that the temporary tent facilities were collecting the contaminated waste and then dumping it back into the water table. So kind of a recontamination problem. That there was too temporary to deal with the actual issue of, of decontaminating the waste. So this facility created an actual wastewater treatment system on site, something that we could actually decontaminate the waste as we collected it on the very site. Uh, and this is a pretty interesting idea. It's almost a leapfrog idea. We worked with these uh, civil engineers to develop it. Um, and the notion that we can actually treat the waste on site um, becomes an opportunity to address the larger systemic problem uh, around the failed sanitary system in, in Port-au-Prince. So this would be the site where we're putting it. Um, but of course the question is, could we put more? Could we use this as a prototype? Build four, build 10, build 15. And in essence, start to sort of leapfrog the problem of a failed system with localized solutions in those, in those sort of sub-regions of the city. Um, this is necessary to have a building to accomplish this. It has to be a system that functions. It's going to treat uh, the patients who are coming in with cholera, but also it's going to address the kind of flow of epidemic when it outbreaks. So this to us allows us to think about a building at scale. We talked about, um, or it, was, it was mentioned by Adam, the kind of opportunity to work on national infrastructure guidelines for the government of Liberia and the government of Rwanda. And this is exactly what happened after we worked on the hospital that we work on one single prototype and then be asked to think about it at a national level as a, as a guideline or as an approach to a whole uh, scale shift. So this is this thinking that um, reminds us that architecture is not object. It's not simply a fixed sculpture. It's actually a process. And if we design a process correctly, we have to think about the entire system, the entire infrastructure that process uh, could affect. So I'll kind of close with this final question by Paul, I think, who really was converted to the idea that our design can have massive effect. So his question was, he said to me in an airport one day, the question is not really what is the cost of architecture, how cheap can we make it, how fast can we build it, but actually what's the cost of not having architecture, quantified in deaths, quantified in lives lost, quantified in property lost. What's the cost of not having architecture, something we should be asking ourselves every day. Thanks very much.